Welcome to the Femininja Project. I am your host, Cheryl I Love, middle-aged ninja hiding in plain sight, dedicated to restoring human dignity one person at a time and helping you unleash your personal power. Discover that it's possible to look like a woman, act like a lady, move like a ninja, and think like a warrior. And remember, men are always welcome on the Femininja Project. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Femininja Project. And I am so excited to have a return guest. His name is Dennis Berry. Dennis is a life coach specializing in addiction recovery, alcoholism, and life mastery. He is also a motivational speaker, author, and host of the Funky Brain Podcast. His best-selling book is titled Funky Wisdom, A Practical Guide to Life. Since this is Dennis's second time on the show, I do want to mention that you can listen to his first episode, which was very enlightening and very interesting. It is episode number 85, Wisdom, Brain Power, and How to Master Your Life. Dennis, welcome back to the show. It is wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm so happy. I, I always love our talks. We have great conversations. We do. I love it. It's a lot of fun. And uh, it's, a, it's very organic. And, you know, we don't have that all the time with everybody. So I, I enjoy when we do get to talk. Mm -hmm. Haven't talked in, oh gosh, I bet it's been about four or five weeks. So it's amazing that time is just going so fast, it seems. So what have you been up to? Yeah, that's really funny that you say that. It's, time is whizzing by. It seems like the George Costanza Yes. Remember George from uh, Seinfeld? He said, life's like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> My dad used to say that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I find that is true. I forget exactly what we did speak about last time, but I think I did bring up the fact that I was going through a, a separation. Yes. It and, was still fairly new. Yeah, it was fairly new. And so, you know, now we're four months in. And uh, so it's been enlightening and I definitely don't want to spend the whole time talking about that. But every day, uh, life is opening up uh, new doors. I'm seeing things differently. The sun's brighter. I'm starting to just feel better about myself and life. And, you know, a lot of the realizations I get to, and, and I think we all get into dark places sometimes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came to me just this morning, I did a really long 20-minute meditation and when I get into these moments of sadness, because the bleeding heartache part is over, it's not like I'm, I'm not like crying all the time, but I still get the waves of sadness. And the truth is, you know what? It's like, I'm, I could be sad the rest of my life. It's okay to have these periods of sadness. You know, it just means that I lived, you know, is what that means. But life's not over, it's just starting. You know, and the way I talk about it now is I'm 48 years old, and this is just chapter 48. Mm -hmm. You know, like pretty soon it's going to be chapter 49. Then I have 51 years left. Mm -hmm. You know, there's plenty of time left. And when I get stuck in the sadness or stuck in the self-pity or uh, any of that, I'm wasting my time. So how do you lift yourself out of that sadness? Because we all have sadness. We all have obstacles. We all have, I like to say, you know, life is full of bumps in the road, of course. And life is also full of hits. Hence, you know, the martial arts analogy and how we deal with those hits, how we can um, either deflect if we can or get out of the way or how we can kind of use our uh, ninjutsu type of skills to work around it and turn it into our advantage. So how do you do that for yourself? Well, there's a couple of things on a daily basis that, that are just part of life now. And I think for to be the most effective person, we, we should all practice these on some level. And that's when I wake up in the morning. You know, healthy routines are crucial. And as a coach, I coach people through this stuff all the time. You know, if you're unsettled and angry and resentful and fearful every morning when you wake up, let's start changing the things that we do when we wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. right? So instead of grabbing the phone and looking to see what some politician is or is not doing for us somewhere, let's, why don't we read something productive and let's not put the phone on right away. Let's meditate for a little while. Let's see how we're going to kill this day today. Like what does the, what good is going to come out of this day today? Can we rock it? That's right. And uh, we do that by waking up, reading something productive, 
sitting in calmness and uh, stillness. If, if I could be in silence, that's even better because, you know, when I'm calm, the answers tend to come and then I can exercise and, you know, eat something healthy or I really don't eat much in the morning anyway. Cause I find if, when I do it actually it like clouds my, my vision a little bit. So I try to see, I keep it pretty light. If anything, I'll have some fruit or vegetables or something, but that's how, that's like starting your day. Well, if I start my day with a bunch of fatty food and uh, getting upset or worried or full of fear, that's the way the day goes. It's up to me how my day goes, right? Every, everybody has that choice. So I've been doing a lot of meditating, a lot of deep, really deep meditating. And just uh, when I do that, I realize what the truths are. The truths are the world is not caving in around me. It just feels that way sometimes. And uh, if I stay focused on that, then that's the way the day goes. <laughs> so, and the other thing with meditation, because I'm a huge proponent of it, I think you are too. And I, I think that uh, even if you're a happy person, what I'm noticing in my life is even when I'm at my happiest, if I'm not meditating, I'm not as happy as I could be. Mm -hmm. I have so many, there's so many noises out in the world. And this is something we talked about before the show. And I'll kind of dive into this a little bit. The world is just such a busy place. We're all doing all this stuff. We need to get there. And along the way, there's the traffic and the sirens and the noises and all the stuff. And it has us so overwhelmed and stressed out. And we don't even realize it. You know, that's why when our shoulders are like, you know, all cramped up and we don't even realize how tense we are until we actually get to some silence. So you ever notice if you go on vacation to the beach or the mountains or wherever you go, you calm down almost instantly. And when you're there, you're on vacation. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the vacation, everybody always says the same thing. Oh, it's back to the real world tomorrow. But this isn't the real world. This is the world that we've created that has us all stressed out and worried about things that are out of our control or that we have to pay these bills and you know fix this relationship and you know get in this traffic and to do all these things and we're overwhelmed and stressed out and it's making us sick so we have to pay a bunch of money to go back to the real world where we belong it's a total paradox and as soon as we get there we calm down and that's why we the reason is is because we belong there that's where we belong at the end of the day we're just creatures right? We're animals. And we belong in that, in that natural environment, free from all the screeching noises and sirens and lawnmowers and leaf blowers and snow blowers and screaming people and the news and all this stuff. That's the stuff that's actually like killing us and keeping us sick. So as soon as we get to the real world, mm -hmm. there's that relief. There's the fresh air and the silence. So just think if you can recreate that, that silence, that fresh air on a daily basis, how much more calm will you be? So one of the few things, a uh, couple of things here that I wanted to interject because I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of meditation, but I don't do it myself very much. My version of, re of meditation is basically like movement meditation or even just going out to my yard. So there's that happy place, the natural state, or if I go, it's a big yard and it's a quiet neighborhood. But because of the smoke from all the fires lately, can't really sit out there because the smoke is just kind of like killing me. Uh, but we went up to Grand Lake, my husband and I, a couple of weeks ago, just for three days. And it was so amazing because as soon as we got there, I love the mountains. And it was just like, oh, I'm home. And one of the things, we rented a cabin and we sat outside and we we're in front of a street and there were no cars. And we just sat there and we just looked around and it was so relaxing. And the next morning we walked into town and we're sitting on a bench on Main Street and we're just watching the traffic go by, which was maybe one car every five or 10 minutes. And it was like, yeah. can we live here? This is, yeah. oh, I do need to sit outside more and just get that sense of calm. Yes. And we're fortunate. We live in Colorado, which is a beautiful place to live in. You know, we're never too far away from that type of stuff. And I think that every state has something to offer like that, where you can get out, you know, there's the Southern states have beaches and the Northern states have mountains and there, there's lakes and there's rivers. There's, there's, there's some place to go if you make an effort. 
Now, you can't go do that all the time unless you arrange your life to do that. Right. And I used to live in mountain towns. I was an old skier. Really? And I used to, yeah, I'm an old ski guy. So I used to live in mountain towns and I did that for like 10 years, my whole 20s. So I lived in, I was a ski bum, which kind of led to my crazy lifestyle, mm. which is why I'm like the sober addiction recovery coach now. But, you know, I, what I found is like, it's a beautiful place to live. I have a lot of friends that still live there and they thrive there. For me, it, I just wanted more opportunity and more things. But along with that comes the stressors and, uh, you know, the traffic and things like that. But we can always get away if we need to. And I think sometimes uh, if you can't get away for a whole weekend or a week or whatever, just go outside for a walk and make an, make an attempt that, you know, there's a, there's actually a thing called earthing. Have you heard about it? We talked about that, I think, on the last uh, episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really great. And I think it's just go outside, take your shoes off and step in the grass for a few minutes or even the dirt. And just like, you know, there's people that they get into the scientific part about it where they think that particles from the uh, dirt or the grass energize your body and go into your, and it may be, you know, I'm not a scientist. I don't know. But I just think that we belong outside in nature. I, I've been telling my clients a lot as far as the meditation being cumulative. It's like if you pick up a dumbbell and do 10 curls and then come back next Wednesday and do another 10 curls, you're not going to get the results. It's the same thing with meditation. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so overwhelmed that we really need to calm down. And I think uh, if, if we're meditating every morning, we're calming down. And then why not meditate at like, you know, 11 or 12 o'clock? in the middle of the day and then meditate again now in the morning you might do this long 15 20 minute meditation or maybe even longer i don't know maybe you don't have that long whatever it is but as long as you're making that effort to quiet the brain because the brain is the source of all my problems thus the name of my podcast the funky brain podcast however uh, throughout the day if you're feeling overwhelmed or angry or sad or just like you know off in general grab your phone, go sit on the toilet for a few minutes and calm down. You could pull up YouTube and do a meditation for a few minutes. But I think if you're not having a good day, start over. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait till tomorrow when you screwed up the whole day, you lost a whole day. Start your day over right now. Have a good rest of your day. And if at four o'clock it's off again, go sit down for another three minutes and start over again. And you still have like, five hours before bedtime. In my case, it's like three because I go to bed early, but. <laughs> I, do I do too. But that, that is an excellent point because a lot of times we think, oh my gosh, the whole day is shot now. And you know, you can always hit the reset button. It's not one day at a time or one week at a time or, or you know, it's minute by minute by minute. And we have the power to be able to change it. If something isn't going our way, you know, we always can take control, sit back and say, all right, let's just hit the refresh button and let's try this again. And the one thing I, I really dislike, I mean, the holidays are eventually coming up and New Year's is when people make the New Year's uh, resolutions and, you know, I'm going to completely change my life, my diet, I'm going to exercise every single day, I'm going to do all this, these enormous changes that they want to make for their New Year's resolutions. And then it's like, well, by the, that, you know, now it's the middle of January and I haven't done anything, so I'm a failure. No, you just start all over again and make small changes every single opportunity. And to take that even further, if you don't mind, if I shift a little bit, when you say that, because I bring this up with the New Year's resolutions all the time, part of my the coaching and the way I mentor and coach people is that we focus on the one thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this would be really valuable stuff to talk about for a second since you brought it up because you're like, with the New Year's resolutions, I'm going to do these five things. I'm going to lose weight, fix my finances, fix my relationship. I'm going to stop drinking. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then next New Year's Eve, all five of those things, the same things are on New Year's resolution list. So what we focus on in my, in my uh, coaching practice is the one thing. Mm -hmm. And what we do at any given time, you only be, want to be working on one major goal, not five, because when you're working on five, they don't get done. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why the New Year's resolution list is like that. So what we do is we really determine what that one thing is. Now, it could be a physical goal. It could be to lose weight. It could be a financial goal to start a business, to write a book. It could be to uh, grow your current business, or maybe you're in sales and you want to grow your sales, whatever it is. Or it could be an emotional goal. It could be forgiving somebody that's actually abused you 40 years ago. It could be like, what's your one big thing that if you conquered that one thing would radically change your life. So we focus on that one thing. And we do that by finding out like your beliefs and your behaviors that are going on in your life right now, your beliefs about yourself right now, and then your expectations about where you want to be in each of those categories, whether it's your physical, financial, spiritual, your relationships, whatever. And then once we narrow it down to that one big thing, that one main thing, then we create specific action steps to get that one thing done. And that one thing, it could take a couple of days to get through, or it could take a year to get through. But we, don't, we want to do the one thing. And finding that one thing, it's usually the one that you've been putting off the longest, the one that you've been delaying or denying or procrastinating on that's keeping you from being as happy as you can be in life. So we focus on that one thing, we create specific measurable action steps, and then we get those done in a timely manner. And then before you know it, you've got that one thing done. And then we move on to the next one thing. At any given time, you want to be working on all of us, any one of us. That's how you get better at whatever it is you want to do in life. Focus on the one thing and get it done. So I'm curious when you're working with clients and you are focusing on that one thing, do you have them journal or keep track or write down their progress or, you know, how they're feeling, how they're doing? Because I know I always encourage my clients to, to do that. It gives you something to look back on and, and mark your progress and see that, you know, oh yeah, I am making positive gains and positive steps. Absolutely. Yeah. I give homework every session and I, and I have them do it. And send it to me too, because without that accountability, uh, we rarely get these big major goals done. Mm -hmm. Rarely. When we do, when you see people that get them done without an accountability partner, it's extraordinarily rare. It's usually called a miracle Mm -hmm. because we, we just don't get it done. We all have great, great intentions. We wake up in the morning. I'm going to conquer this goal. This one big thing that I've been putting off for the last 20 years. And we wake up, we have that, that drive, that motivation, and then something happens or we get a phone call or we have to sit in traffic or something happens and we don't get any progress done. So I think having that accountability is huge, that accountability partner, the coach, the mentor, to make sure these things get done. And that's why we create specific smaller action steps and then move through those steps one at a time. And before you know it, that's done. And if they're not doing that homework, you know, sometimes I'll let clients go. Mm -hmm. because if they're not doing their homework, they're not going to get to their goal. And then they're going to say, Oh, well, Dennis wasn't a good coach, Mm -hmm. but I am. I'm like, we're talking about it. We have your tasks in front of you and what needs to be done to get you to that goal, but you're not doing it. Mm -hmm. So if you're not doing it, then you're not going to get to where you want to be. You know, it could be a a relate fix my relationship thing. I work with uh, men and women, uh, husband and wife, but I work with them separately. Mm -hmm. because you never work together because it doesn't work that way really well but in my experience it's like it's more of a band-aid when you're the couples are sitting there together and then you have the counselor because they don't open up and they're not 100 percent honest about everything but when you work separately they open up and we work on each other you work on yourselves and then you bring your improved self back to that relationship Mm -hmm. right so you're both growing and i find that that's that's really effective but at the same time if i'm working with you for your relationship and we're going over, oh, well, these are my behaviors in my relationship. I'm shutting down, I'm sensitive to criticism. I am just not emotionally available. And you're not doing the homework to help overcome and change some of those behaviors. But anyway, the point, absolutely what you said, I have them write homework assignments every week and it changes every week. There's some that I do that are consistent every week too. Like I have them do like what I call four and four exercises. So every night before bed, I want to write down four things that I did well today and then four places where I fell short. Mm -hmm. So that way we can see where I'm doing well and where I'm falling short in life. And usually when you do that every night, uh, you'll start seeing patterns like places I fell short. I mean, they'll send those to me 
And then after like four or five days, you'll see, oh, well, they fall short here every day. Well, that's something we need to work on. Mm -hmm. So this is, that's accountability. And that's what makes a difference. Do you see people doing like incredibly transformative changes? Um, do you see all of a sudden breakthroughs? Are they gradual or is everybody different? Which wow, that's an excellent question. Yeah, no, it's definitely different. I have a, one kid that I work with. He's 19 years old and he was sleeping till like five o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock at night. He was sleeping until... And now I have it. He's, he's sending me his schedules. I have him waking up at seven o'clock. He's applying for college. He's exercising every morning. He's uh, eating fruits and vegetables and changing his whole life. And, but it took like a, probably six weeks or so to get there. And then one day everything just like flipped and some people move more like real gradually. Uh, some people take a lot longer. Some people it could take mon many months and some people will just have a couple talks and two weeks later, their whole attitude about life has shifted. Mm -hmm. So maybe it, it just depends on the personality. It depends on what kind of pain we're going through in life. Are we willing to see things differently or are we stuck in our own brains and our own ideas of how life is supposed to go? And I'm not ready yet to listen to somebody tell me how to live my life. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that take longer. Well, everybody's brain is different. And, you know, I've studied, of course, in my physical therapy career, a lot of neurology, but it got really interesting when I started studying Feldenkrais and a couple of other things um, that were not mainstream. And it is really amazing, the brain science and how much control, you know, we really have over our lives by changing the neural pathways in our brain. And uh, where some of us get so stuck is we've trained those pathways or we've established those pathways to actually work against us. So it's kind of just like trying to interrupt that traditional or that habitual pattern and allow for a healthier pattern and a different one to emerge. And to me, that was truly mind boggling and mind changing and life changing. The brain science is so cool. But the funny thing is, when I got my master's degree in physical therapy, I graduated in 1996. And all through all of my neurology classes, we were taught that neuroplasticity, which is, you know, the malleability of the brain to be able to change, actually disappeared at the age of 14. What? I know. I haven't heard that. I thought it was uh, 26 is what I heard. We were told that it, it was at the age of 14. But of course, now we know with all of the breakthroughs in neuroscience over the past 20 years, that that is not true, that this neuroplasticity exists as long as you still have a pulse. Mm. So if you're alive, the neuroplasticity is there and you can change. It might take a little bit longer if the pathways have been so well established or like you said, been like that for 20 years. Okay, it's going to take a little longer to change that pattern, but it can be done. It can be done, yeah. And going back to the uh, the writing mm. and the homework assignments, like those are so important. Like when you talk about how our 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 brain was programmed over time, that it's going to take time to reprogram it. So it might have taken if you're talking about thirty years of programming our subconscious minds to do certain behaviors that were harmful or hurtful. Um, it's going to take more than a week to reprogram that. And we, we got into those patterns by doing these behaviors over and over and over and over again, every single day, year after year for an extended period of time. So in order to reprogram the subconscious mind, we need to do these things over and over and over again, every day for an extended period of time, depending on, again, how, what the behavior is. And I would like to mention something about the subconscious mind. You just triggered another thought for me. Just like you said, when you wake up in the morning, you don't pick up your phone, you don't turn on the TV, you don't do this, you just take that, that time for yourself. But it's amazing how much our subconscious actually takes in. So when the TV is on or the radio and we're hearing these messages over and over and over again, our brain is taking them in and recording them. And it's yes. not saying what is good or bad, right or wrong, reality or, or imagination. It just is taking it in just like a computer and you keep that information going over and over in your brain and eventually it takes over and it is all of a sudden now your absolute belief system, even if it's not healthy or serving you well. 
That is such an awesome explanation of everything that's going on. One of the things that I've been doing the last couple of weeks and my coach, because I have a coach, but he um, has me doing this and I'm on week three now of turning everything off. Now we have to do work and almost all of our work is all on computers and stuff nowadays. But if it's not work related, it's off. So that means like when I'm working out, no music, when I'm driving, no stereo, no radio, no news, no nothing. The phone is off. I need social media for my business as do you, but I only have to, or I'm only checking that uh, twice a day, once in the morning and once uh, sometime in the middle of the afternoon. But outside of that, no other sound. I'm turning everything off, no TV at night. It's amazing how often we reach for our phones to look at something, to go turn the TV on, to turn the music on. We're so unsettled and we don't even realize it that we need to have something on to take us away from all the, the stressors that are out there. So it was originally a one week exercise, a seven day exercise of just quiet. And then when I was done a couple weeks ago, he goes, all right, now we're doing another week. And I was like, what? <laughs> and uh, he's like, yep. And then last week he's like, all right, one more week. I was like, what? But, <laughs> But I'll tell you the the answers to life, to what your next steps are, where you want to go, what you want to do, who you're supposed to be, they come in the silence. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. We're so desensitized to everything. We're so used to the noises and the distractions from our everyday thinking that we don't tune out anymore and we really need to in order to get clear. What I love is that your coach pulled a very classic ninja distraction trick on you. <laughs> right. Right. It's like, but it's, it's even like what you were talking about earlier with your clients. If you say, okay, we're going to do all of this at one time now, it's overwhelming. But he just took it a couple of days at a time, then a week at a time. If he'd have said to you, okay, Dennis, we're going to do this for four weeks, you probably would have gone, eh, I don't know about this. But he just kind of weaned you into it. So then, you know, your brain patterns were changing. And it was like, I don't need this. Yeah. And I, was, I brought it up to one of my clients just yesterday. And I said, we're going to do a week. Just turn everything off. And you could see his face. He was like, what? <laughs> so I, to be honest, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to pull it off. But, you know, again, the idea of this stuff is to bring awareness. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're, we've got to do the best we can. You know, when you go back to like biblical times or uh, Buddha and stuff like that, when they came up with these religions and the rules that go along with them, they didn't have traffic. They didn't have 401k plans. They didn't have the bills that we have to pay today and the stressors that we have. They're idyllic principles that are really hard to live up to, but we do the best that we can. So, you know what, if I can like, instead of listening to the TV or the phone or the stereo for like six hours a day, what if I can do that for like two hours a day? You know, think about how much more clarity is going to come in when I'm not distracted with those noises that are reprogramming my subconscious mind to live in fear and anger about who some politicians doing for or against me. And none of them are helping you or hurting you as much as you think they are. And that's, that's giving your power away to somebody else. You know, I don't want that little device wherever it is, right? Oh, it's over there to be controlling my life. And it does, it controls your life, yeah. And you know, just even from a, a personal safety standpoint, just seeing especially women walking around with their phone in front of their face and not paying attention to their environment, that is so incredibly dangerous. And that's exactly what predators are looking for. They're looking for an easy target. And you're training yourself to not pay attention instead of living in this, 360 degree world where I'm always aware of what's in front of me, beside me, behind me, you have it narrowed down to this tiny little what, like, you know, six inch or eight inch or whatever by four inch device in your hand that is literally controlling your life. And there's also something, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of mirror neurons. I have not. Okay, so it's like um, if, if you're talking to me and you're happy and I'm having a crappy day, you're happy, you're laughing, you're smiling, and I'm looking at you and the same neurons responsible for the response in my brain fire up. And same thing vice versa. So it's amazing how influenced we are by other people, which is why it's so important to choose your friends carefully and the people you hang around with. But how many times have you seen somebody reach for their phone 
and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I need to reach for mine. Yeah. Any of these addictions, anything that uh, I deal with on a regular basis, and I know you'll understand all of this stuff, all these things are just distractions. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking about the phone right now, but drugs, alcohol, food, porn, shopping, all of these things are just distractions from feeling, Mm -hmm. right? So it's like, I don't want to feel, I don't want to be sad. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be resentful. I don't want to like what's going on with politics or the world. So I'm going to do this instead. And all of a sudden those things, take over our lives and we're not learning how to feel and process things that are going out in the world. And then we start taking medications or whatever it is. And and we don't learn. All you have to do is calm down to turn things off, meditate for a little while and start to just learn how to cope. I never learned how to cope until my mid thirties because, uh, you know, I, I think we talked about my story last time. Like I, I started out as a little kid with full of the fears, insecurities, the angst, the heartache, the, the anger, and I just didn't know how to handle life. And so when I started drinking, I didn't have to handle life anymore. It just took me out. It distracted me. And I didn't have to learn how to cope. But the problem is at some point you have to learn how to cope. Mm-hmm. And I didn't learn until my mid-30s when I finally got sober and cleaned up my life. And uh, But the thing is, I could still move into cross addictions. So I removed the alcohol and drugs, but I could still eat a pound of cookies, <laughs> you know, because I'm a little overwhelmed, you know, that's emotional eating or, and sometimes, you know, you, it's definitely in my case, it's better to eat a pound of cookies and to drink a, a, a pint of whiskey mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, it's just not good for me to do that. But I still have to watch out. Like, what am I doing? Like, where do I, the, People listening might say, you know, sometimes I do that too. It's not that bad. But the idea when we get back to focus and what my goals and dreams are, we need to establish what's my goal, what's my dreams, what what is it I want to achieve, where do I want to go? Is my behavior right now going to get me there? Mm. Is it serving me? Is it going to help me get to make the money that I want, to have the partnership that I want, the the romantic relationships, to have the career that I want and, and to have the health that I want is eating a pound of cookies. Good for me. Probably not. It's drilling holes in my pancreas, but so I probably shouldn't do that, but always be focused on a goal. Right. And that's what helps you get to where you want to be in life. And is my behavior helping me or hurting me from getting to that goal? And you mentioned it earlier in the show that it's about awareness. And at yes. first when people are thinking about that, it might seem, overwhelming because you know to have that much awareness and it it is something that you learn and you have to practice and then all of a sudden it just you're training it like you train anything else in your life yeah sure and in my and again with how i work with my clients is like you know when that moment comes where you have that craving that's going to take you out that's going to whether it's drinking or eating a pound of cookies or buying things on Amazon or watching four hours of Netflix or whatever it is, looking at the iPhone, it's like, what, let's do some writing. Writing is so powerful. You know, it really does, does slow the brain down. It makes things tangible. And you know what else it does? It reduces stress Mm -hmm. because if I'm thinking, right. And I think, I probably talked about this last time too, but we have on average like one thought per second throughout the whole day, right? 60 to 80,000 thoughts per day. If I can write stuff while, while I'm writing, it's considerably slowing my brain down. Mm -hmm. So not only uh, does it show me exactly what's going on up in my brain, but then I don't have to worry about what was it I was just thinking. It actually reduces your stress level. So writing is really powerful. So part of the writing exercises we would do is like, if I can't eat that pound of cookies or if I can't drink or smoke that cigarette or whatever it is I'm doing, what can I do instead? So let's have a list of things, of things that I can do instead of eating that pound of cookies. So when that thought comes up, because something has to come between the thought and the action. Because when I think, all right, I need a, I need a shot of whiskey and then, I take that shot of whiskey. Something has to come in between there. Mm -hmm. So what can come in between the thought of the whiskey? Oh, wait, instead I'm going to do, I can go for a walk. 
I can meditate. I can call somebody I trust and talk about what's going on in my head. When I do that, now the time has passed. You know, that few minutes has passed. And that craving tends to go away. The average craving lasts only about three minutes. You know, there's science, scientific study to show that only lasts about three minutes. So with that in mind, when it comes up, if I could sit quietly for just a few minutes, I can get past a few minutes, mm -hmm. right? If I think, oh, I can't do this for the rest of my life, that's overwhelming. But all right, I could sit here for a few minutes and calm down. That's doable. When you're talking about writing, the difference between writing pen to paper versus typing on a, a keypad. Yeah. Did you, did you want to address that at all? Or do you have any specific thoughts or feelings about that? Because I kind of... Sure. Do. Yeah, sure. Well, in my experience, and we could bounce back and forth on this, is uh, that the writing slows the brain down even more because we all live on a computer now. All of us can type 100 words a minute. However, what was happening with me was that I was writing, I have my ye yellow legal pads, and I had like one in the bedroom, one in the office, one in the living room. They were all, one in the bathroom. They were all over the place and they weren't organized. So for organizational purposes, sometimes what I'll do is I'll write because I've, in my opinion, writing is way more powerful, pen to paper. Mm -hmm. But we're also older, right? So the younger generation, they don't write anything. And to be honest, I was like, anything, writing anything more than my signature is really like inconvenient. <laughs> I'm like, I have to actually slow down my life enough to write. But again, the point is to slow down. So I prefer writing. And then what I'll do is I'll like type my notes onto the computer and then I have it all in one place like organized because I, I learn a lot from my writing. So that's my thoughts on it. I think the idea of it all is to slow the brain down and nothing slows it down better than actually writing pen to paper. I love writing. I have tons of notebooks like you all over the place. And a lot of them are even related to, you know, my martial arts training as well as my ballet classes. Even now I take notes. And it's not, oh, this is this combination, but it's just little aha moments and what really kind of resonated with me and stuff. So, and I find it very calming and I love using pencil to paper because I even love the sound of the feel, you know, it's that tactile sense of holding it and writing and the, the sound of the, the pencil scratching against the paper. I just love that for some reason, it's really reassuring, which is funny because all my life I've been told I have horrible handwriting, but <laughs> I can just let it rip and just be as, as creative as I want to and as flamboyant with my handwriting. And it's like, I'm the only one that needs to see it anyway. Um, so yeah, it is, it's really calming and it does slow me down. And I find sometimes writing on the, you know, typing, cause I, I never learned how to type. That's one of my deep, deep dark secrets. So don't tell anybody. <gasps> Shame on you. No, but I, and even one of my sisters said, how did you finish high school? You have to take typing. And I'm like, I managed to get out of it. So. <laughs> yeah, it's not that important. You know, it's what's important to you. Focus on what's important to you. Well, and I think it's part of um, my many idiosyncrasies because, you know, I'm a writer that can't type. You know, I'm a speaker that can't speak. I ended up with some uh, vocal cord dys dystonia. And I'm a physical therapist who hates exercise and thinks that chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny story. Yeah. Um, um, I am a uh, beach boy living in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, That's good. That's my big one. Like, I love that. I love the warm weather we're having right now, the hot weather. And uh I prefer the beach. I don't like the snow anymore. I skied thousands of times and uh, I probably, I haven't been in, I think five, maybe six, five or six years. I just don't like the cold weather anymore, but I love the, I love living in Colorado. It's the most beautiful place to live. Well, we won't tell anybody that we really have good weather because we want them to think that it snows all the time. <laughs> right. That is what happens. People come to Colorado to visit and then they go back and pack up, get, grab the kids and move here. And that's yeah. why our population explosion has been huge over the last few years. Yes, it has been. Well, I've been here for 42 years. Yeah. Since you were two? Yeah, I drove myself when I was two years old, packed my <laughs> Ford Maverick and drove across the country. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So what's going on in your world? Tell me a little bit about you. I mean, I'll, I'll do the reverse interview. Oh, 
oh my goodness, okay, well, you know, same old, same old. It sometimes feels like Groundhog Day all over again, but I have been really going crazy in the kitchen and I'm still doing basement ballet every couple of, you know, times a week. So we're still doing virtual ballet classes, but it's working out very well. And uh, the dojo is open, so I get to go to the dojo and swing swords at people's heads and stuff about once a week. And yeah, still doing pole. Um, the podcast is going great, having so much fun with it, meeting so many fascinating and wonderful people. It has just been turning into something that I had no idea that it was going to, to turn out like this. So I'm really having a good time with that and meeting a lot of people online, you know, for interviews and stuff, which has really just been crazy, crazy. Uh, went back to working on my book about my journey into the world of martial arts. And right about now, I'm at 62,000 words. And at this point in the book, I'm still, uh, I'm a brown belt. So we're getting ready to kind of wrap it up and, and everything. So I'm hoping to be able to get it to my editor by December. Nice. And yeah, still, that's a big feat. It's a huge one. Well, and this is, you know, I've been feeling out of sorts off and on lately a lot as far as, you know, my whole journey that I'm writing about was over a 13 year period of time. When I first walked into the dojo, a terrified, petrified, you know, middle-aged princess and going through like, I'm not going to do this. And it's like, oh, it's kind of fun. I kind of like it to getting stronger and stronger to eventually becoming, you know, Mark's first female black belt. And a lot of wonderful, wonderful, powerful stories, a lot of funny stories, but a lot of stories aren't that good. And they're not um, that good. No, there's been, you know, when you're going through something like that, and martial arts is really kind of strange in that way, is that as you're climbing up the ranks, and there were several experiences of betrayal, and where I was just had the rug pulled out from underneath me, and it's like, wait a minute, you people are my friends, you're my teacher, I trusted you, and yet that you're treating me like this. And it was just, you, you know, the anger and then the sorrow, and it's like going through all of that again, which is what happens when you're writing a memoir. So, but it, it's been interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, you have experiences of what you're going through. So you're bringing stuff up from the past that was painful and challenging. So you tend to have those experiences while you're digging them up again. All over again. And then even like, you know, the funny ones, there was one time I was sitting at the computer typing in my style of typing and just laughing and laughing. And I couldn't stop laughing because I was telling a funny story of uh, like one of my first experiences in the dojo. And I mean, it was hilarious. And I thought, oh my goodness, why didn't they just throw me out? I mean, <laughs> I did that when I was writing my book. I had a story about um, how, let's see, it's about worrying about what people think about me kind of story. So, you know, I'm always, somebody's talking to me and I'm worried like if I have spinach in my teeth and, that, and like, I'm, I'm totally going to screw it up now. But while I was typing it, I was cracking up like you were just talking about. And it was like three or four pages worth. And I had, I was with uh, my ex at the time and I had her read it and she was like, you know, it was okay. It wasn't as funny. Like I was dying, cracking up, laughing the whole time. And I was like, oh, it was like, do I have a bugger in my nose and all, like, all this stuff. The whole story is in my book. But to me, it was the funniest thing in the world because I was like, this is awesome. And she's like, yeah, that's good. Oh, yeah. I guess <laughs> she didn't love it. You did. And it's... Uh, that's another point I want to bring up is that laughter is the best medicine, isn't it? It really is. And, you know, about, it was about two, somewhere between two and three months ago, because uh, the first month of going through my separation here was the, one of the most painful months of my life. And uh, then it was, a, I think it was about two months ago, I was laying in bed and I was watching something on TV and I don't remember what it was and it wasn't that funny, but I, it struck me as funny and I started cracking up and it was the first time in months that I really had a belly laugh and it changed my whole week. Mm -hmm. So I, one good laugh can really just make a huge difference. And so I, you know, try to do that regularly. It's good. Like if, you're, if, if you're going through something, you want to go through it. Right. Like if you're sad, or angry or fearful or resentful. You want to like learn the message from that pain, feel it all the way through. But you also, 
you don't have to do that 24 hours a day. Right. And, you know, feel the pain, feel whatever the message is. What lesson is this trying to teach me? And then go eat something that makes you feel good and go for a walk and then laugh something and just like change your mindset from sad to happy. It's really that it can be that simple if you allow it to be. I actually interviewed a woman a couple of weeks ago and she was talking about her experience becoming a widow. And you know, that you know, she said they had the widow's fog and then you have the grief and all this stuff. And she had taken care of her husband for about two and a half years before he died. And she said, finally, she sat down one day and she binge watched. I can't remember what sitcom it was, Frasier, and laughed the entire time. And it was like, I did it, she said, because I realized if I could laugh, I could go on. Yeah, that's but, a great message, a great story. When you lose your sense of humor, what's the point? Yeah, I mean, that's, the, that's your attitude. So if you're watching like, uh, you know, like crazy, suspenseful, scary movies and shows, that's, how, that's gonna be your experience. That's how your day goes. I, mean, I like to be entertained, but I, I like to laugh a yeah. lot too. And then I, <laughs> hopefully you just not listen, but that's one of the things that we used to disagree about with me and my ex was, I, I didn't want to watch the sad uh, tearjerker, like bloody murder, suspenseful things. I just want to laugh. I want to giggle. I want to, be, I just, I want to like be entertained that way. Like, I, I guess some people love those horror pictures and I can go back and I remember watching like The, the Exorcist, The Silence of the Lambs was one of my favorite. It was just such a, like a twisted psychological thriller just like a crazy movie and i used to love love that but i don't anymore like i mean my life could be a psychological thriller <laughs> i i want to break from that i want to watch fraser too man i want to put something on it's going to make me giggle like what like when i was 13 years old again you know i want to pull up the seinfeld episode of the junior mint right <laughs> where it went into the guy's body when they were doing this operation <laughs> I laughed so hard, I fell off of the couch. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, well, laughter is the best medicine. You're absolutely right. That comes from Reader's Digest. But um, yeah, but if you think about what we talked about earlier with meditation, if meditation puts you in a peaceful state, let's meditate more. If laughing makes you feel better, let's do that more. Like, the, think about those times. Every time it happens, like, how often do we have belly laughs? Mm -hmm. anymore okay i think back to a kid i used to have belly laughs all the time and we were carefree we didn't have to worry about the retirement plan and all the stressors in life and everything we would just have these belly laughs and i want to i want to lol more often did i talk last time about the the story about my little niece so so i was watching her it was one of my i was never when i was drinking and using drugs you know years ago um I wasn't around families. You know, I had removed myself from that because I knew I was messed up and I didn't, I wasn't around kids much. So when I, um, when, after I got sober and uh, started changing my life and I, my niece was born and I was babysitting my niece for the first time. It was my first babysitting thing since I was like 13. I was 33 or something like that. And uh, so I was babysitting for her in the middle of the afternoon and my sister said, don't give her anything to eat because we don't want to ruin her appetite. So she was in the, the living room and she was watching something on TV, some cartoon, and she was giggling her ass off. She was just cracking up, laughing hysterically, having such a great time. And she came into the kitchen where I was and she wanted a Twizzlers. Mm. And I said, no, because your mom said nothing before dinner. So she went from hysterically laughing to hysterically crying in one second. So her face turned purple. She had tears coming down. She was screaming. And I was like, well, screw that. I don't want to deal with that. So I gave her a Twizzlers. <laughs> and so she took her Twizzlers and she turned around and started walking back into the living room. She started laughing again. So when we think about like where we are right now, we all have so much going on in our lives and in our minds that we don't have that freedom to express our emotions, how we feel anymore. So that's really my goal is I want to be, I want to clean myself out of all that crap that we have, all the stressors, the worries, the fears in our lives. 
and just be free to express how I'm feeling. I want, I wish I can go from laughter to crying to laughter again. I love crying. I can't even really do it anymore because I'm like, I'm too busy to cry. But when, you know, when you're crying, it's really painful. But right after that, there's this, it's cleansing. It's purifying. And the laugh, to be able to laugh, the reason we don't have the belly laughs anymore is because we're all just worried about too much crap. Well, Dennis, you've never gone through menopause. So I can tell you that yeah, <laughs> it's possible to go from hysterically crying to, you know, joyful laughter to hysterical crying, you know, at just the drop of a hat. No, I have not. And uh, I don't think I'm at the right age yet. No, but... You have no idea. <laughs> well, I'm glad. So on that note, I think we're, you know, <laughs> that's good. On the menopause note. <laughs> we'll just stop here. Thank you so much for being here, Dennis. Again, I appreciate it. And just tell my listeners, our listeners, uh, where they can find you. Yeah, best way is right on my website, DennisBerry.com. And from there, you can buy my book. You can get to my podcasts on YouTube, Funky Brain Podcast with Dennis Berry. And on all the audio channels too. And any coaching session, you can schedule a session with me. And uh, that's the best place. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate you being here. It's always wonderful talking to you. And everybody, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you. And just remember to get a little bit more laughter in your life. That is the way of the Femininja. So just go for it. And that's a wrap on another episode of The Femininja Project. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, be safe, be strong, and until next time, bye now.